Crash Connell, a fresh new podcast today today on Stand Up For The Truth. Date on the calendar, Thursday, March 28, 2024. Mary Danielson at the host mic. Yes, and good morning to all those who are listening in for another podcast at Stand Up For The Truth. Uh, we have Todd Nettleton of Voice of the Martyrs. He's back with us. And we're going to hear about our church family in other parts of the world. We don't maybe share a pew with them, but we will certainly share eternity with them. And we appreciate Todd's time this morning. I'm going to open with a scripture, as always, and we are going to pray. I'll introduce Todd, and we will get right to it. And my scripture this morning is John 17, 1 to 5. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Wow. Let's pray. Oh, Lord. It is our prayer also that we glorify you with our lives because of what you did, Lord, the free gift, and that it would be in good times and in difficult times as well, Lord. We know that the struggles you allow in our lives are for our benefit, that our faith would be purified and we would be prepared for an eternity with you. We lift up those who are having health issues or they're struggling with loss or relationships, that we might choose the hard road of faith every day despite circumstances and things that we don't understand. We lift up our brethren who are giving all for their faith in the face of of threats and loss themselves. Lord, comfort them as only you can. Let us be faithful in prayer for them in all seasons. We lift up Todd to you today for all needs to be met, for good health, for endurance, and for all the details of day-to-day ministry. Thank you for his labors and his faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, we have Todd Nettleton, with us today. He's the Chief of Media Relations and Message Integration for the Voice of the Martyrs USA and host of Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Todd serves as a voice for persecuted Christians, inspiring U.S. Christians with the faithfulness of Christ's followers in 70-plus nations where they face persecution for uh, wearing his name. Persecution.com. Todd, welcome back to Stand Up for the Truth. Thanks so much. It is great to be with you. It's been a while, hasn't it? It has been. Yeah, it really has. Um, you know, as I look through the various mailings that I get from Voice of the Martyrs, I, uh, you know, I pray that I can keep up with the prayers. And I know you keeping up with um, not over overseeing all this, but coming alongside Voice of the Martyrs uh, and the people that are overseas and just uh, providing hope and strength for them is just an incredible ministry. And we just thank you for doing that. And, and I was telling you off the air, 70 plus nations, Todd. That's a lot of believers who are struggling, and I think that's a number that kind of hit me between the eyes this morning. Um, what, what, how, how can we drive this home to us Westerners who just go about our days and, and hope to fulfill a few dreams before we die? How, how can we uh, impress upon them how important this is? You know, I, I hope that what impresses on them is the Scripture. And, uh, you know, Hebrews 13.3 is really a foundational verse for VOM, uh, it says, remember those in prison mm. as if you were there yourself. Mm. Uh, remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. That's the New Living Translation of that verse. I, I like how it says, as if you were there yourself. Mm. If you were the one in prison, what would you want to know? You would want to know that people are praying for you. You would want to know that people are reaching out to your family that's not in prison and saying, hey, are you okay? Do you have enough to eat? Do you have a roof over your head? Those are the things we're supposed to do. And the other thing that I think is really important for people to understand, and it is typically not our experience as American Christians to face persecution, uh, but it is promised in the Scripture. And I I use that word intentionally. It is promised. Uh, Jesus said, the world hates me, and if you follow me, the world will hate you too. The fact that we in America don't often experience that doesn't doesn't make it less true. Mm -hmm. Uh, And our brothers and sisters, as you said, in more than 70 countries where persecution is just a regular part of following Jesus— uh, they understand that in in many ways better than we do, and and honestly, they have a lot to teach us. They have a lot to share with us 
about what it looks like to say, you know what, Jesus is so important to me that if you lock me in prison, I'm still going to follow Jesus. If you beat me up, I'm still going to follow Jesus. Uh, if you, you know, even kill me, I'm still going to follow Jesus. There's nothing that you could do that's going to stop me from following Jesus because it's that important. It's that vital to me. Uh, like I say, we we love learning from that example, and I think all of us can be inspired by that example. Mm-hmm. Yes, agreed. Let's talk about China first. Um, there's some information about a Chinese pastor who was released from prison after a seven year sentence. And he has some stories, I understand, about how he was treated in prison. I was online this morning reading a a post from VOM Korea called Inside a Chinese Prison. And that really fleshed this out for me as if I were there, as you were just saying. Tell us about this pastor who was released. I mean, praise the Lord. I always think they languish forever in prison in China. But what can you tell us about him? Yeah, the the good news is that he was released. Uh, The bad news is that he is not being allowed to leave China. His wife is actually an American citizen and lives in America. Uh, He would love to get on an airplane and be reunited with his family, but so far the Chinese government has not given him his ID documents. Uh, He is not allowed to travel. He's not allowed to make a doctor's appointment. He, Without that ID document, uh, it's almost like he's still in prison, honestly. Uh, And yet he is out of the prison You mentioned how he was treated inside, and I think this is very fascinating. He was seen as such a threat inside the prison uh, that three fellow prisoners were assigned to monitor him every waking moment of his life during the last seven years in prison. Uh, There were three fellow prisoners. They were told, do not let him speak to anyone else and do not let anyone else speak to him. So even if another prisoner would say, good morning, Pastor Cao, Mm. these three prisoners would be punished. Like, hey, how did you let another prisoner talk to him? We can't allow that to happen. And, you know, you think about that for a minute. What are they scared of? What what do they think this man in prison is going to do? Well, obviously, they think he's going to share the gospel. (laughs) They think he's going to tell people about Jesus. Uh, They think he's going to grow the church inside the prison. And so... Every waking moment, he had three other prisoners monitoring him. During the nighttime, he had a person standing guard over him as he slept. Uh, and, and he wrote about this after he got out of prison. Like, what? What are they worried I'm going to pray? Uh, and he kind of joked, well, that's okay. I can pray while I'm laying down. You know, I can pray with my mm. eyes closed laying down, and that person can just stand there. That's not, that's not going to stop me from praying. Um, but, you know, it's very interesting to think about Here's this pastor. He was helping minority people groups, tribal people along the Myanmar border. And actually, you know, it's it's interesting. What he was arrested for and charged with was illegally crossing the border uh, because he was helping along that border. He was going back and forth across into Myanmar and back into China and so forth. There are hundreds of people who cross that border every single day, uh, but they decided to arrest Pastor John Sao and say, oh, yeah, you crossed the border illegally. You didn't have the right permission. You didn't have the right documents. You're going to go to jail for seven years for doing that. Uh, And even in jail, they saw him as such a threat. They didn't want him to speak to anyone else. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, he talks about how the Lord was faithful to him over the last seven years. In fact, uh, he wrote Poetry, really, I I would say he wrote psalms while he was in a Chinese prison the last seven years, uh, praising the Lord, thanking the Lord Mm. that the Lord was with him, even as he was so isolated, even as he was not allowed to speak to anyone, uh, the Lord was still there in that Chinese prison. But I would encourage people to keep praying for Pastor John Sao, especially mm-hmm. about this document and about the ability to leave the country to get back with his family. Um, we just pray that that will happen soon. Wow. I'm surprised they didn't just put him in some kind of solitary confinement because it's the same thing. You're so isolated, you can't even speak to another human for seven years. Wow. And, and of course, the Lord drew near to him. He drew near to God. I'm surprised they let him write anything because that's a form of communication as well. And, you know, it's interesting. He wrote about, uh, after he got out, his mom would send him letters in prison. And I, I think she wrote 90 letters, and he was allowed to get 31 of them. Uh, and she figured out, they, they kind of worked out by trial and error, how much scripture she could put in a letter before the 
the authorities wouldn't let it go through. Uh, and so he said she could put, you know, one or two or three sentences of Scripture into a letter, and, and typically that would get through and, and get to him. Uh, if she put more than that, typically he wouldn't get those letters. And so she learned, hey, you know, I can put a verse or two. Uh, I probably shouldn't put more than that if, if it's going to go through. So, uh, you know, his, his prison Bible was those few lines uh, from the scriptures that his mom could kind of smuggle in through her letters. Wow. Wow. You know, Todd, every time we talk, I, it, it comes back to me how why I love talking to you so much, and that is because you put flesh and bone on these people in 70 countries. Such You can start with these generic statistics, but when it comes down to the individual stories, as are found in the books, the Voice of the Martyrs books, it's an entirely different experience, and it puts us there with them. Like I said, initially, we don't share a pew with them, but we're going to share eternity with them, and they are every much, every bit as much, our family in Christ. And so thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. Uh, also in your notes, um, you mentioned that China has actually changed its strategy as far as, far as how they're charging Christians for their quote-unquote crimes. Um is it a way that they are using to hide their persecution in that country? Or tell us about that. It, it absolutely is. And I I find this very fascinating. And it actually, when I found this out, it harkened back to a conversation I had with a house church pastor in, in China uh, about five years ago now, maybe six years ago now. I was there. I had the chance to interview a house church pastor. And one of the things he said, and I'm I'm kind of embarrassed to say I had never thought of it before, is he said he explained how they handle the money in their church. You know, people bring their tithes. Uh, in America, you know, you go down to the bank and you put the checks and you deposit it into the church bank account. You know, that's it's pretty normal. That's how we do things. Well, a house church, an unregistered church in China— doesn't have legal permission to exist. They the, they don't have any documents that say, hey, we have a church. So they can't go down to the bank and say, hey, our church wants to start a checking account. You know, we need to be able to put our tithes and offerings into the bank. They can't do that. And so this pastor explained to me, well, what they do in their church is they divide up those funds among the church leaders, among the deacons in the church, and each one of them is responsible for the portion that's entrusted to them. And honestly, that's a risky thing, because at any moment, the government could come in and say, hey, where where did this money come from that's in your checking account? Like, what's going on mm. with that? Mm. Um, and so they're taking a risk to do that. But I had never before thought about just the mechanics of having a church and even like handling the ties. Like, how much of a problem is that if your church doesn't exist? So that brings me to a conversation I had with Bob Fu just a couple months ago, and he said, starting about the beginning of 2023, so just a little over a year ago, no church leader has been charged with religious crimes. They haven't been charged with holding illegal religious gatherings. They haven't been charged with using a religious organization to undermine state security. All of the charges that we've seen over the last a little more than a year now have been financial charges. They're charged with illegal business practices. They're charged with money laundering. Mm -hmm. They're charged with those types of crimes. And, you know, from the perspective of the government, your church doesn't exist, and you're taking an offering for a church that doesn't exist, that's fraud. Oh, we're going to charge you with fraud. Mm -hmm. But it also is, as you mentioned, it's a way to hide persecution, because if I call the Chinese embassy in Washington, D.C. and say, hey, why, why did you arrest this pastor? Why are you persecuting Christians? They will say, oh, we're not persecuting Christians. We're, we're cracking down on financial crimes. We're mm. cracking down on fraud, and we couldn't allow this fraud to go forward. And so this has nothing to do with his religion. This has everything to do with fraud. So they are hiding the persecution of Christians behind this, oh, yeah, we're tightening up the financial regulations. We're really cracking down on fraud in China mm. right now. Um, and it's a way for them to say, no, nope, it's not religious persecution. It's not Christian persecution. And still, they can lock up these church leaders. Wow. Yeah, that's that's a little scary, and I'm, and not really terribly surprising because they will find ways to to persecute believers. That, that if that's you know, and the enemy is creative too. The devil wants to to do this, and so he he'll be creative in these people's hearts and minds. So, very very interesting. Um, Todd, let's go over to India because um, uh, Voice of the Martyrs has changed how you classify India. Uh, on your prayer map, from hostile to restricted nation. And uh, does this, uh, you mentioned something about a prime minister who is, who's running again. Um, and 
I was reading about him just last night that he would like to make India a Hindu nation, uh, a divine nation, which would mar- marginalize a lot of other groups like Sikhs and Buddhists and, and Christians. But tell us about what does that mean to go from hostile to restricted? Yeah, this is this is a, a significant change for us here at Voice of the Martyrs. So when we talk about places where Christians are persecuted, we classify them as either a hostile area or a restricted nation. And uh, the biggest difference is who is the persecutor. Uh, in a hostile area, it is not the government. Uh, it might be oh. your family members. It might be a terrorist group. It might be someone else oh. who is persecuting Christians. But the government at least is is saying the right things about religious freedom. They're at least saying that it's okay to be a Christian. In a restricted nation, it's the government that is driving the persecution. Oh, okay. And so this change in India reflects the fact that under Prime Minister Modi, and, and as you say, he's running right now for re-election. Those elections start in a few weeks. They will finish up in May. He has already had two five-year terms, so he's been in power for oh. 10 years. He's running for five more years. And his philosophy, as you mentioned, and and the philosophy of his government, the philosophy of Hindu nationalists that, that he was sort of raised up by and put in power by, is that India is a Hindu nation. Uh, literally, there are government leaders who will talk about the soil of India is Hindu soil. Mm. And so if you're not a Hindu, you don't actually belong here. This is not your country. Mm. There's not a place for you here. You need to mm. either become a Hindu or you need to go find someplace else to live, because this is a Hindu nation. And so it's one thing when there is a group of Hindu nationalists that are espousing that philosophy. It's a totally different thing when the national government is now saying, that's our philosophy. That's how we're going to make laws. That's how we're going to enforce laws. That's how we're going to make decisions. This is a Hindu nation, and only Hindus really have a place here. The thing about this is, is, is this is a part of Prime Minister Modi's uh, appeal. Th- this is part of his campaign, and India is a primarily Hindu country. Most of the people are Hindus. Most of the voters are Hindus, and so he has he's made that work. He's been elected twice. Mm-hmm. He will likely be elected again in just a few weeks. Mm-hmm. And you know, as Christians, they look at that and say, "Wait a minute." This is our country, too. The The Constitution says we have a right to be a Christian, uh, but we have seen persecution increase so dramatically under Prime Minister Modi. We've seen pastors put in prison. We've seen churches raided, uh, church services broken up, pastors beaten even inside their churches. Uh, one of the amazing slash frustrating things is when uh, a group of Hindu nationalists will break into a church during a service They will beat the pastor, they'll beat some of the people in the church, and then the police will come, and they will arrest the pastor, who has just been beaten. And it's like, wait a minute, he's not the criminal here. There are criminals who should be arrested, but he's not the one. But he is charged, he's alleged, you know, he's forcing people to change their religion. He's forcing people to convert. And so the pastor will be the one who goes to prison, even after he's already been beaten up by these Hindu nationalist mobs. So uh, it it's a very strategic time to pray for Christians in India, especially in this election season, uh, and especially as they think about, okay, what we know what it's like now. What's it going to look like after five more years of Prime yeah. Minister Modi, five more years of Hindu nationalists in mm. power? Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I had not heard of him. I didn't know he was in that, that long so far, but uh, uh, India is 78% Hindu, so that is, of course, a wide majority um, what about Easter time, Todd? Do you find that uh, are you hearing more and more that there's persecution is cranked up, uh, particularly during Holy Week? You know, it, it is a very strategic time to pray for the protection of our brothers and sisters. Uh, most of us will probably go to church this Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we will not think one moment about security. Right. We will not think one moment about, okay, is it safe to go to church? Like, should I be watching out for people? Should I park far away? Um, should I maybe stay home this Sunday? Mm-hmm. That's reality, though, in hostile and restricted nations. And, and think about this. This this makes sense when you think about it. If you hate the gospel, if you hate the message of Jesus Christ, what better day to show how much you hate it 
than Easter, the day we celebrate Christ's resurrection. And so, you know, I, I think back and most of us heard about or saw the footage of this. It was five years ago this Easter that Sri Lanka, three different churches were targeted on Easter Sunday morning by suicide bombers who said, hey, what better day to attack the church? What better day to attack Christians than on Easter Sunday, on the day so many of them are gathered together? I hope our brothers and sisters who are listening will pray for the protection of of our Christian family on this Easter Sunday, because it is a day where they can be targeted, where they do face uh, sort of a heightened danger because it's such a holy day. Yeah, we do not think of that. We're thinking about when is Good Friday service and what will I wear for Easter? It's so far from our thinking, and this is a great reminder to pray for our brethren around the world who cannot, um, who don't even think along those lines either. It's a very, very different experience. Talk about uh, foreign Christians expelled from Nepal, uh, Todd. Um, Christians arrested for outreaches there, and and apparently they face some very long prison sentences. Who are these foreign Christians in Nepal? Yeah, this is a story that is is kind of developing even as we speak right now. So far in in the last couple of weeks, there have been nine foreign Christians arrested in De, 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 Nepal. Uh, I, actually, I would say detained. So far, six of them have been deported. So they got detained by the police, and then they got put on a plane and said, hey, you're leaving. <laughs> Whether you want to or not, you're leaving, and mm-hmm. you're not coming back. Uh, there are two foreign Christians who are still waiting to hear, okay, what Are we going to be deported? Are we going to be formally charged? Are we going to be put in jail? There are also eight Nepali Christians who have been detained as a part of these outreach efforts. One of the interesting things, in 2017, Nepal passed a new, I I believe they called it a religious freedom law, but it actually is a persecution law. It, It put in place restrictions against outreach, restrictions against talking to someone about changing their religion. Uh, they, they would say forced conversion, but you know when you share the gospel with someone, they can choose to convert. They can choose to follow Jesus. It's not that you're forcing them. It's that you're telling them the truth. But that is against the law in Nepal. And it's interesting because I, I mentioned six of these foreign Christians have already been deported. The law actually specified that if you were a foreigner and were caught and found guilty of breaking this law, you would be deported, but first you would spend years in prison. And the law is very clear. The the prison comes first, and then you get deported. So these foreign Christians that have already been kicked out actually are are blessed that they didn't have to spend years in prison before being mm. deported. Mm-hmm. The two that are waiting to find out, that's that's one of the questions we have, is are they actually going to be formally charged? Um, Nepal is heavily dependent on tourism as a part of its economy. Sure. Uh, and so I'm sure they're very cautious about saying, oh, yeah, we're going to lock some foreigners in prison here mm. uh, because that may scare off the tourists, and mm. we don't want to do that. The other big question about this is the eight Nepali Christians who have been detained. Obviously, they don't have the the uh, protection of a foreign passport. The way the law works there is they can be held for 25 days for the police to investigate. At the end of that 25 days, they either get released or they get charged. Uh, we're not yet at the end of that 25 days, so we don't know exactly what's going to happen with them. We don't know how this is going to go, uh, but certainly an item for our prayer list yeah. is these Nepali brothers that are currently in prison. Wow. Wow, a lot of prayer opportunities here. I'm talking to Todd Nettleton of Voice of the Martyrs, persecution.com, and I strongly suggest getting their free magazine. It comes to your house or your church, and you can put uh, flesh and bone on these people who are suffering so much for the gospel, so many great testimonies. Um, I want to. We have about five minutes left, Todd. It went so fast as usual. I want to talk about the I Am N virtual event that you had, and also the book I Am N about stories about persecution at the hand of radical Islam. And today's prayer focus I noticed on my calendar is Iraq, which is uh, great because I started listening. I had the audio book I Am N on Audible and started listening to these testimonies. It's so, so powerful. So talk about the IMN virtual event with the few minutes we have left. Yeah, this is a great event. We had it uh, just a few weeks ago on a Friday evening. Uh, We had three speakers who have really faced uh, radical Islam, kind of come face-to-face with radical Islam. Heather Mercer was arrested and held captive by the Taliban in Afghanistan. 
Hassan Abdurrahim was imprisoned in Sudan, actually arrested with my VOM co-worker Peter Yasek. Uh, John Samara works in the Middle East, actually leads a team of gospel workers and church planters in the Middle East and North Africa. His father is the pastor of a church in Damascus, Syria, so he's very in tune with what's happening in Syria. And then our worship for the evening was led by Stephen Curtis Chapman. So we had a we had a great event. Here's the great news. It's now available to stream. So you can watch it whenever. If you if you missed it earlier this month, you can still watch it. And I am encouraging people, don't don't watch this by yourself. Uh, get together with your Sunday school class, get together with your Bible study group, get together with your whole church and be a part of this I am in event because the the challenge that was given was really the, the challenge that Christians faced uh, across northern Iraq, across Syria, it's actually, we're coming up on 10 years ago that ISIS sort of washed across the Nineveh Plains, invaded the city of Mosul, and Christians' homes were marked with the letter Noon, the Arabic letter Noon or N for Nasara, Nazarene, follower of Jesus of Nazareth, and Christians had a choice to make. You know, that they could convert to Islam, they they could flee, or in some cases they were killed because they said, yep, I am a follower of Jesus the Nazarene. I'm not going to change no matter what you do. Uh, and so Christians literally laid down their lives during that period of time. And uh, the IMN virtual event is kind of a way of looking back on that, a way of checking in of, hey, where are those Christians mm-hmm. today? What's going on in that part of the world today? Uh, and also equipping us uh, to be in, to be a follower of Jesus of Nazareth, uh, even if it's even if it's against opposition, even if it's not mm-hmm. the popular thing to do, mm-hmm. uh, wherever we are, we want to follow him as well. Mm-hmm. I am N is on persecution dot com, and there is a link. It says when you're on the main page, it says watch now on demand, and it gives the the name of those who the names of those who were part of that. Uh, so yes, it's very very easy to find if people are looking for a link to watch that or watch it. Uh, Watch it with your family and uh, keep, you know, let your kids know this is what's going on with our brethren around the world. And um, I was reading, Todd, uh, oh boy, a minute and a half left. I guess I'm going to toss this over to you. Is there anything else that uh, we haven't gotten to that you would like to talk about in the last um, uh, minute and a half? (laughs) No, I, I don't think there's anything else other than, you know, I always encourage people to listen to Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Uh, we recently had a conversation with Jeff and Els Woodkey. Jeff was a, a hostage in West Africa for six and a half years. Uh, literally for about five of those years, he was chained to a tree uh, most of his time. And so his suffering was off the charts. Uh, but the faithfulness of God was also off the charts. And uh, Jeff said early on he made the decision, hey, these guys could beat me, they could starve me, they could kill me, uh, but they can't make me hate them, Mm -hmm. and I'm not going to hate them. And he said the Lord empowered him to forgive his captors. And literally he said, I didn't feel forgiveness, I didn't feel warm and fuzzy towards them, (laughs) but I would tell them verbally, I forgive you, Mm -hmm. I forgive you, I forgive you. Uh, So if people are looking for some inspiration, it's a hard story. I'll warn you, it's a hard story. Uh, But find that interview. You can find it on vomradio.net. You can find it wherever you find podcasts. Uh, But Jeff and Els have just an amazing story of God's faithfulness in probably one of the hardest situations I've ever heard the story of. Uh, One of the... Todd, thank you so much. It is such a blessing and a privilege to talk to you every single time. And Voice of the Martyrs is what a wonderful ministry. And we appreciate everything you do and all those who are on the front line, all the ways you come alongside our persecuted brethren. And keep reminding us, Todd, keep reminding us um, to have these people in our hearts and minds and prayers. So um, next half, some headlines, actually sort of an eclectic mix. We're going to talk about Israel quite a bit, but maybe in something you have not heard before. So stay with me. We have about a two-minute break here, and we're going to be back with the rest of the podcast shortly. Thank you. Feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. Email us at comments at standupforthetruth.com. We're back at Stand Up For The Truth for this Thursday, March the 28th. And I'm going to jump right in here. Uh, We had Todd Nettleton on the first half, Wish of the Martyrs. 
If you missed that, I strongly suggest that you catch the podcast later on. What a blessing he is to the body, especially those um, being held for their faith. We're going to switch gears today, and there's an article. Hal Lindsey put out an article uh, just a couple weeks ago entitled, The Israel We See Today is Biblical Israel, and God Placed the Proof in Their DNA. Hmm, that sounds like an interesting subject. And there are those today, of course, you know this, that um, and pulpits too, who say that 1948 is not a fulfillment of prophecy and that those in the land are not true Jews. They are occupiers, etc., uh, this article is going to set up what I want to talk about in the second half, so let's get right to it. Here's Hal's article. The Israel we see today is biblical Israel. Some would say that can't be true because the people of that nation do not generally live in the Old Testament commands. But when did people of Israel ever live up to the law of Moses? History shows that the Jews in Israel today descend from the Jews in Israel 2,000 years ago, and God placed the proof in their DNA. Do you know what that means? It means the Bible is true and you can trust every word. The Jewish people remain distinct and regathered in Israel is one of the greatest of all biblical miracles and it's taking place right now before our very eyes. There were many dispersions of the Israelites from their homeland. Those dispersals culminated with Rome sacking Jerusalem and destroying the temple in 70 AD. The children of Israel were dispersed around the globe. This is called the diaspora. They were physically and economically assimilated into cultures the world over, and yet, miraculously, they remain a distinct people. Hmm. And their DNA proves it. Michael Hammer of the Arizona Research Laboratories at the University of Arizona summarized the results of his major study of the DNA of Jews from various places in the world. Quote, despite their long-term residence in different countries and isolation from one another, most Jewish populations were not significantly different from one another at the genetic level. The results support the hypothesis that the paternal gene pools of Jewish communities from Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East descended from a common Middle Eastern ancestral population and suggest that most Jewish communities have remained relatively isolated from their neighboring non-Jewish communities during and after the diaspora. Hal goes on to say that was in 2001. His results, his results have been confirmed several times since. A 2013 study released in the peer-reviewed scientific journal Nature concludes, quote, These results trace the origins of most Jewish diaspora communities to the Levant. Now, the Levant means the area bordering the eastern Mediterranean. In other words, the land of Israel. In all of history, there is no other story like this one. These people were exiled from their land. They met harassment and persecution everywhere they went. On more than one occasion, they faced attempts at genocide. Every human instinct would be to hide within the surrounding culture and remove your distinctions, but they did not do that. They kept their faith traditions and they married within their faith community. The people of the small nation were dispersed and spread around the world 2,000 years ago. They are not a race, but to this day they remain a distinct people with genetic markers placing their ancestors in the area of ancient Judea. It's nothing less than breathtaking. But here's the kicker. 3,000 years ago, God said it would happen. See Ezekiel 36 and 37. Notice that Israel is to be regathered before their spiritual renewal. And this is what people don't understand who say that they cannot be Jews in the land. They will be gathered in unbelief. Hal says, since the establishment of modern Israel in 1948, a significant portion of the world has made the destruction of this tiny nation their great priority, including several immensely wealthy oil-producing nations. But with all that money, And the power that goes with it, they haven't removed little Israel. It's a miracle as potent in its own way as the parting of the Red Sea. It's a sign to the nations that God keeps his word and nothing can stand in the way of that. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will by no means pass away. Matthew 24, 35. The ongoing existence of Israel and the Jewish people prove it. And that's my setup for the rest of this half hour. I want to dig a little bit deeper, and I want to connect the very old with the very current. Now, I mentioned on Tuesday the current headlines explaining the necessity of the ashes of the red heifer to rebuild a temple in Israel. And that is to take place uh, in a season of time leading up to the return of Jesus, the second coming. Now, as Gentiles, we may not give this much thought, but this is very important to a certain group of people on the other side of the world. Now, My second article, there are three total. My second article is an older article by Chuck Missler entitled The Tribe of Levi and the Coming Third Temple. 
And this is a short uh, excerpt I'm going to read today that lays more of a foundation. He says, a group of Jews believed to be members of the ancient tribe of Levi gathered in Jerusalem last week. Now, this is a few years ago. To edify one another and bless Israel. There's more to the gathering than a simply f- a simple family reunion, however. Moses and Aaron were Levites, and the sons of Aaron were called to be priests of Israel and minister in the temple. These descendants of the priestly line of Israel cannot gather together without awakening the hope for rebuilding the temple. The Romans destroyed it in 70 AD, and ever since, the priests of Israel have felt a keen hole in their calling. The sons of Aaron were given the job of ministering in the temple and serving as priests in Israel, not just for a set period, but forever. Hmm. Exodus 29.9, And the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statute, and thou shalt consecrate Aaron and his sons. Numbers 25, 13, and he shall have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made it an atonement for the children of Israel. And Chuck goes on to say, yet for nearly 2,000 years, there's been no temple and the Dome of the Rock sits on the Temple Mount. Yet certain groups like the Temple Mount faithful and members of the tribe of Levi wait with hopeful expectation for the day when the temple will be rebuilt. When that day comes, the Aaronic priests a Kohen, in Hebrew, will be necessary to minister in the temple. They also serve another vital function, and that is no Jew will be able to enter the temple to worship without first going through ritual purification, which can only be accomplished by a Kohen. Okay, so that is Chuck Missler's further setup of this. I want to make a couple of definitions here. I think that will be really, really helpful. Maybe you've heard of different names for geographical and historical populations of Jews. The first one is Ashkenazi Jews. Now, Ashkenaz is the Hebrew word for Germany, and this is where Ashkenazi Jewry uh, flourished in modern times. They were in our Eastern European Jews. They spoke Yiddish primarily, which is a combination of German and Hebrew and Aramaic and a couple of other languages. And you've all heard common Yiddish words that, and maybe you've used them from time to time, like oive, klutz, chutzpah, schlep, schmooz, and many, many others that have just entered the general vernacular. Now in Genesis 10.3, Ashkenaz is listed as a son of Gomer and his brother is Togarma. They are historically associated with the Scythians, and you, Ezekiel 38 and 39 scholars, know what that means. Ashkenazi population peaked by 1930 in Europe, but it was significantly diminished by the Holocaust being Hitler's primary victims. The second group is Sephardic Jews. Now, they are a Jewish diaspora population associated with Spain, Portugal, and Northern Africa. They are the ones who were kicked out of Spain following an edict on March 31st, 1492, by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And that's 532 years ago, almost to this day. It is a fascinating story how the departure of nearly 200,000 Jews from Spain literally trashed the Spanish economy. Oops, I bet they didn't see that coming. All because the royal highnesses demanded that the Jews convert to Catholicism, and they refused. The day they departed is the day Columbus set sail. (laughs) And the rest is world history. Truly, this is the Jewish part of all that. And it's a fascinating subject if you want to dive into that. There there probably volumes have been written about all this, but uh, that's just to whet your appetite. So speaking of history, and if you wonder if we are truly living in Bible times, like in between the pages, let's connect another couple dots. This is so interesting. So who are the Kohens? A common Jewish surname, or Kohenim, which is plural, and what is a Levite? All right. Certain Kohenim can trace their lineage, lineage through a direct line of males to Aaron, brother of Moses and the first high priest. Now keep in mind that having that name Kohen, because it's very common, either by conversion or in the absence of a Jewish mother, does not qualify as being from that lineage. So about 5% of Jewish men today are actual Kohanim. Now, since Aaron lived more than 3,000 years ago, we can estimate that most true Kohanim have approximately 100 links in the chain between them and Aaron. How do we know that? Well, remember, this priesthood is an everlasting priesthood, so God said it. That's how we know. 
It is a perpetual statute, according to the scriptures. And we're going to find out how true that is. Secondly, uh, the Kohanim are a subset within the tribe of Levi. So like Moses, Aaron was a grandson of Levi, one of Jacob's 12 sons. So in counting the 12 tribes, you will not find a tribe of Kohen, since they are included within Levi, all of whom have a, a priestly role. Okay, Moses was a Levite. So like so many other advances in the last couple of decades, DNA research puts a fascinating period at the end of a sentence about who these Kohanim were and are. And so we're going to take a look at the, at the research. This article, it's called The Kohanim DNA Connection, The Fascinating Story of How DNA Studies Confirm an Ancient Biblical Tradition by Rabbi Yaakov Kleiman. It says, Dr. Karl Skorecki, a Cohen of Eastern European parents, was attending synagogue one morning. The Cohen called up for the Torah reading that morning was a Jew of Sephardic background whose parents were born in North Africa. Dr. Skorecki looked at the Sephardi Cohen's physical features and considered his own physical features. They were significantly different in stature, skin color, and hair and eye color, yet both had a tradition of being Kohanim, direct descendants of one man, Aaron, the brother of Moses. Kohanim are the priestly family of the Jewish people, members of the tribe of Levi. The books of Exodus and Leviticus describe the responsibilities of them, which include temple service and blessing the people. Uh, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, describes the anointing of Aaron, the brother of Moses, as the first high priest. Jewish tradition, based on the Torah, is that all Kohanim are direct descendants of Aaron, the brother of Moses. It is a patrilineal line passed from father to son without interruption for 3,300 years or more than 100 generations. Dr. Skorecki considered, according to tradition, this Sephardi Cohen and I have a common ancestor. Could this line have been maintained since Sinai and throughout the long exile of the Jewish people? As a scientist, he said, hmm, can such a claim be tested? Being a nephrologist, which is a kidney specialist, uh, and a top-level researcher at the University of Toronto and the Rambam Technion Medical Center in Haifa, which is one of the top-notch research centers in the world. He was involved in breakthroughs in molecular genetics, which are revolutionizing medicine and the study of life scientists. And he was also aware of a newly developing application of DNA analysis to the study of history and population diversity. He considered a hypothesis. If the Kohanim are descendants of one man, they should have a common set of genetic markers that they're co of their common ancestor. In this case, Aaron Ha Kohen. Kohen in Hebrew just means priest, okay? And that's followed by a lot of uh, DNA and genetic technobabble that I won't bore you with, except to say um, this is a powerful, powerful tool to study human populations and the uh, how they uh, traveled around the world and where they ended up. And I know Answers in Genesis has, has been doing that for a long time. So Dr. Skorecki made contact with Professor Michael Hammer of the University of Arizona, a leading researcher in molecular gene uh, genetics and a pioneer in Y chromosome research. Uh, he uses DNA analysis to study the history of populations, and he has been working with Native American uh, Indian origins and the development of the Japanese people. So a study was undertaken, and if there was a common ancestor, the Kohanim should have common genetic markers at a higher frequency than the general Jewish population. Uh, in the first study, uh, reported in 1997, 188 Jewish males were asked to contribute cheek cells from which their DNA was extracted. Participants from Israel, England, and North America were asked to identify whether they were a Kohen, Levi, or Israelite, and to identify their family background. The results of the analysis of the Y chromosome markers of Kohanim and non Kohanim were very significant. A particular marker was detected in 98.5% of Kohanim and a significantly lower percentage of the non Kohanim. In another study, uh, Dr. Skorecki and associates gathered more DNA samples and expanded their uh, selection of the Y markers. Solidifying their hypothesis of the Cohen's common ancestor, they found that a particular array of six chromosomal markers was found in 97 of the 106 Cohen's tested. This collection of markers has come to be known as the Cohen modal haplotype CMH, the standard genetic signature of a Jewish priestly family. The odds of finding this happening at random is greater than 1 in 10,000. 
The finding of a common set of genetic markers in both Ashkenazi and Sephardi Kohanim clearly indicates an origin predating, okay, this is important, predating the separate development of the communities. Okay, so there weren't always these two communities that I defined for you earlier, but around 1000 AD, we had the uh, Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews. Um, Date calculation based on the variation of the mutations yields a time frame of 106 generations from the ancestral founder um, of the line, some 3,300 years, the approximate time of the exodus from Egypt, the lifetime of Aaron the priest. Um, there's a lot more here. Um, professor, it says Professor Hammer was recently in Israel for the Jewish Genome Conference, and he confirmed that his findings are consistent, that um, almost all of the Kohanim have a common set of markers. Calculations based on the high rate of genetic similarity of today's Kohanim resulted in the highest paternity certainty rate ever recorded in any population. And it's a scientific testimony to family faithfulness that, you know, they say the wife was faithful. Well, God is faithful. That is the, what the testimony is. For more than 90% of the Kohans to share the same genetic markers after such a period of time is incredible. Um, and the cohesiveness continues. Jews from Iran, Iraq, Yemen, North Africa, and European Ashkenazim all cluster together with other Semitic groups with their origin, origin in the Middle East. And this, um, this marker can be seen in all mainstream Jewish groups. Um, one of the libels against Ashkenazi Jews is um, perpetuated and has been for decades that they are not related to ancient Hebrews, but they're descendants of some Turkish tribe. But researchers compared the DNA signature of the Ashkenazis against those of the Turkish tribe and found no correspondence whatsoever. But that doesn't pre prevent Mahmoud Abbas of the PLO from reiterating that lie. Um, those Jews in the study who identified as Levites did not show a common set of markers. Very, very interesting. According to tradition, they should also show a genetic signature from a common patri uh, paternal patrilineal ancestor but they do not. Again, they shall have a priesthood as a statute forever, and you shall consecrate Aaron as his son, as, uh, and his sons. And note, too, that uh, Ashkenazi Jews were the ones targeted by Hitler, and these are the ones that have the, the genetic marker for Kohanim. That is very interesting. So thanks to these advancements in the realm of understanding human DNA... The Temple Institute in Jerusalem is able to have a registry of current Kohanim. Oh, how interesting. The Temple Institute has reconstructed many of the temple vessels and the furnishings and the priestly garments that might be needed for a temple. The first time I visited the Temple Institute, I was stunned um, by so just, just the work and the passion that they put into these preparations and these beautiful these beautiful garments. It was like st uh, stepping into the pages of the Old Testament. So, you know, God clearly gave the heart, the faith, the brain cells to produce, uh, pursue such things. Of course, when we speak of a rebuilt temple and the hope that this brings to those who are living in Israel and longing for their redemption, this temple is only going to be for a short season as God deals with Israel to take them from unbelief to belief to finally recognize their long-awaited Messiah. Um, it's going to be unlike a time the world has ever seen, the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, God says it will happen, and it will. And I want to read from uh, briefly from Hebrews to clarify, uh, in case there's any confusion. Hebrews seven twenty three to twenty eight. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. Hmm. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. We're not talking about Aaron here, are we? For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Verse 27, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people. For this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who's been perfected forever. So we have Aaron as a shadow 
of the high priest who had no beginning and no end. This is Holy Week, the week that changed the world forever. Now that thought alone should cause every believer to ponder what happened and why. From Palm Sunday to this Sunday, Jesus publicly presented himself as the Messiah. He died at the hands of the Roman soldiers with the approval of the Jewish leaders and our sin. And his desire to do God's will is what nailed him there. The resurrection is the pivotal point in all of history. Think about that on Sunday. Even time changed at that time. Hal Lindsey said, The resurrection of Jesus is supported by fuller and more of a believable evidence than any other event of antiquity. Jesus said it would happen, and it did. He also said he would leave this earth for a time. He did not say for how long. But the night before his crucifixion, in John 14, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So, not one word of his word will pass away. And just a simple thing of looking into the DNA in this day and age to prove, we don't need proof, but to prove that God set up the priesthood forever is just an incredible faith-building thing. And the fact that Israel is in the land once again, and as we started out this segment saying, yes, those are the Jews, and God fulfilled prophecy in a phenomenal way in 1948. And what's going on there right now? God knows exactly what's going on there right now. And there's there's a lot of prophecy to be fulfilled, of course. Uh, so we're watching and waiting for that. But what's going on as far as uh, the face of every nation turning against Israel, Canada recently uh, turned, turned their backs on Israel. Um, there's, a long, there's an article on that on the internet. It's called Canada's Betrayal of Israel. We don't have time to go into that. Uh, there's another one here at uh, Ynet News. Israel can't be pushed around anymore by international pressure. That one I highly recommend because it gives the history of the presidents, beginning with uh, Eisenhower, who made some bad choices uh, against Israel. And it's been going on. There's nothing new here. It has been going on. But whatever is going to happen, Jesus said it will happen. He goes to prepare a place, and he will take us to himself. It will happen. And uh, this is our blessed hope. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead. He lives, my ever-living head. He lives and grants me daily breath. He lives, and I shall conquer death. He lives, and while he lives, I'll sing. He lives, my prophet, priest, and king. He lives, all glory to his name. He lives, my Jesus, still the same. Oh, the sweet joy this sentence gives. I know that my Redeemer lives. It is my hope and prayer that you will have a good church to attend on Sunday where the resurrection the atonement is the centerpiece of everything that is talked about. I was watching um, some on the street, man on the street interviews, asking people, "What? When did Jesus die? What is Easter all about? What are you going to do on Sunday? Um, what year did Jesus die? Was it the 1700s, the 1800s?" And the answers people gave were, <laughs> "Wow, worse than I expected." So never ever o- overestimate what Americans might know about Jesus and about salvation or world history. Those who said Jesus died in 500 AD, they don't even know the first thing about world history. And I can't get that half hour back. (laughs) But even in churches, I don't know what they're teaching on Sunday. Um, The secret sensitive churches, are they going to take advantage of the people that are there um, to talk about what really, really happened on Easter? And I, I truly hope that you can get fellowship on Sunday and that you will uh, rejoice once again in what was done for us and that it will give, give your heart hope in these dark, dark days because we do live in very dark days. So thank you for joining me uh, for another hour podcast. It's such a privilege to, to, uh, to be on Q90 and to do these podcasts. Um, Pete Garcia is with us tomorrow and we're going to talk about world 
War Three, And I know a lot of words have been expended on that, but there is so much going on behind the scenes that we just really, really don't know. If you're up early in the morning, Q90 FM airs two-minute warnings at 5.50 a.m. Central, and you can listen to them in the archives page on demand at two-minutewarnings.org. Two minute now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. Amen. Happy Easter. <laughs>